Um, we're in the book of Hebrews still. Last week we covered uh, chapter 7 and 8, half of 7 that brought us through chapter 8. Um, and we saw how after references that started all the way back in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, which says that he might be made a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, that the case has been made that Jesus is the high priest of our faith. Um, so it's it's been carried all through the book of Hebrews, and it's going to continue even as we'll see tonight. But his priesthood is far superior to any position of any earthly priest, okay? Um, and, and having identified uh, previously the eternal nature of the priesthood of Melchizedek and, and the necessary requirements to be found uh, of one qualified to fill that priesthood according to the prophecy of, of Psalm 110, um, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Okay, identifying Jesus as the one who fills that role. And then chapter 8 goes on to describe the superiority of his priesthood over the priests of the tribe of Levi, who even though they may have been faithful in serving God, um, they, they died. Right? They were people. They died, and so they were not able to perpetuate or to continuously fill their calling as priests. Okay, so that brings us to where we're going to begin tonight uh, in chapter 9, and we're going to talk about covenants and testaments. Reverend Brooks, would you please pray over our Bible study this evening? Hello, Father. Father. We're thankful to be here tonight, God. We ask you to bless this study as we continue to study your book of Hebrews, God. Open our hearts and give us clarity of thought, God, as we receive what you prepare for Pastor Watson. God, we ask you to bless him as he teaches what you think on his heart. We give you the praise, honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So tonight we're going to discuss these, these concepts of covenants and, and testaments, and we're going to see that Jesus, uh, besides being the priest who offered our sacrifice was himself that sacrifice on our behalf. Um, his sacrifice was so far exceeding in greatness and in effectiveness the the animals that had been offered by the priests that he was able to bring in a new covenant with God. Okay, based on a superior testament. Okay. So what are these terms? They're, they're going to be brought out in chapter 9. What are these terms? A covenant, in the biblical meaning, is an agreement between God and his people. Okay? Simple explanation. It's an agreement between God and his people. God made covenants with Noah, with Abraham, with David, and with others. Okay? There's this promises that he said that he would keep with them. Okay? But in terms of reconciling sinners to himself with, with all of mankind, with our need for a relationship with him, an agreement to be made right with him, okay? He made the old covenant, it's going to say here the first covenant, as the means of allowing the death penalty for sin to be carried out upon an innocent party for the vicarious benefit of the guilty. Okay, vicarious means through someone else. If you're watching a uh, home video that somebody shows you of their vacations and you see everybody having a good time and you get real genuine joy out of seeing their uh, experiences because of the people that you love and, and seeing the things that they've experienced and, and just for the fact that you love them, you, you enjoy their joy. Mm -hmm. That's vicarious. Okay, it doesn't mean ingenuine. Okay, it, it just means through somebody else or on behalf of somebody else. So when it speaks of a vicarious death, the death of the animal is vicarious on behalf of those who were guilty in sin. The animal was innocent, and Jesus' death, it's it's vicarious on our behalf. Okay, we're going to get to those in a moment, but the old covenant was a means of allowing the death penalty for sin to be carried out upon an innocent animal for the vicarious benefit of the one who was guilty of sin. And this started way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned against God in eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. 
This was the first death when the animal that was killed so that its skins could be used as clothing for Adam and Eve died. Okay? The animal became the literal covering for Adam and Eve because it covered, they became naked. They saw themselves and were ashamed of themselves. It didn't say God uh, became ashamed of their nakedness. It didn't say that Adam became ashamed of Eve or that Eve became ashamed of Adam. It said that they became ashamed of themselves when they saw themselves. And God said, I will cover your shame. Okay? The animal became the literal covering. Okay? But it also became that spiritual covering for Adam and Eve. And for all sinners until the time of Jesus' death on the cross, the blood of an animal sacrifice was required for atonement with God. That word atonement, you can break it down into its parts. It's spelled A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T. At one meant the state of being at one with God. And that's, that's actually what it means. It's not just fancy to break it down and say, hey, it looks like that. That's actually what it means. It means that you're in a state of being at one with God. Okay, And the blood sacrifice of an animal was required to be at one with God, to have that sin covered up so you could continue in a relationship with him. Okay, Abel, Adam and Eve's son, who was killed by his brother. Okay, Abel offered a right sacrifice with God when he offered the first of the flocks. Job offered sacrifices for God. Abraham and the patriarchs, all of these practiced animal sacrifices before the law was given to Moses. Okay, and We emphasize that because so often people will say, oh, that was just the Old Testament law, when they want to disagree or make an argument against anything. But when it comes to, to atonement through sacrifices, when it comes to God's design for marriage, when it comes to tithing, and so many other things that are found in the Old Testament and brought into the New, we see that they are not part of the law. They actually transcend the law. So if God started them before the law, they were a part of the law, but then they carry through after the law also. Okay, They're not integral to the law. They transcend the law. Animal sacrifices were before the law. They carried through the law, but they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This was God's way to show the cost of sin. The cost of sin. Because in Genesis chapter 2, when he gave the commandment for them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And when we were studying Genesis, when we got to that point, we say, isn't that kind of a harsh penalty for just eating a piece of fruit? And we talked about and, and discussed it at more length, how that when you separate yourself from the source of life, what is that? It is death. To separate yourself from the source of life, to separate yourself from the will of God, is death. God was giving them a warning. Don't separate yourself from me. But when they did, he still made a way for them to be atoned to him. Praise God. He's merciful. Yes, yes, yes. And he said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That death penalty was still passed because in their flesh they sinned. In their flesh they died. They would not have if they had not sinned. Okay? Nevertheless, the animal sacrifice meant that their spirit, their soul could be at one with God. Just as us. Our flesh will one day die if the rapture doesn't happen first. Okay? And this is getting beyond even what chapter 9 is going to talk about. But our, our flesh will one day die. This is more 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and, and 1 Thessalonians type of stuff. But our flesh will one day lay in the grave. But because we're at one with Jesus, at one with God through his sacrifice, we'll go to be with him. Paul even said in Philippians, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, And then one day, even our body will be resurrected to be with him. Okay, But the cost of sin is death. In Ezekiel, he told the prophet, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In the book of Romans, he said, for the wages of sin is death. And in Hebrews chapter 9, which we'll get to, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay, So the covenant that God implemented was his agreement that I will allow this animal's death to stand in the place of your death. But the next time you sin, you've got to offer another sacrifice. 
And the next time you sin, you got to offer another sacrifice. And the next time you sin, you got to offer another sacrifice. Okay. The death of those old animals gave the old covenant its effectiveness. Okay. Now, a testament is a legal agreement that only becomes effective upon the death of the test ador, as it's going to be stated here. It's a legal agreement that becomes effective upon a person's death. The Old Testament was that God would be effective, that God would fulfill the Old Covenant, that agreement, based on the death of those animals. The animals' deaths were what made the Old Testament effective. It was man's part of the agreement. Okay, God said that he will forgive me if I kill this animal. I have to do it the right way. The law says which ones I got to offer and how I got to do it and how it has to be prepared. But God said that he'll forgive me. The death of this animal, animal makes that agreement effective. So chapter 9 shows how Jesus' sacrifice is so far superior to the sacrifices of the Old Testament that with his death, he became the mediator, the testator. Those words are both yours. But it means the one who proves the validity and declares to be effective. The New Testament. Jesus' sacrifice is so far superior to the sacrifices of the Old Testament that with his death, he becomes the one, he becomes the one who proves the validity and declares the effectiveness of the New Testament. He says the old one has been superseded. Okay, chapter 9, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Again, it says a worldly sanctuary. It's going to show that the things pertaining to this world are superseded by the things of heaven. Okay. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called a sanctuary. And after the second veil in the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the pot that had manna and Aaron's rod, which budded and the tables of the covenant. He's speaking, he's describing, of course, it says the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, they had a bowl full of manna. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, they had the original tables of the Ten Commandments. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, if you read back to the book of uh, Numbers, there was a time when there was an insurrection against Moses, and God demonstrated his uh, selection of Moses and Aaron. Uh, Moses is the leader of Israel. Israel uh, Aaron is the high priest of Israel by causing those insurrectionists and Aaron to lay their rods out in front of the tabernacle. And when they watched and, and came to see them again, Aaron's rod, though it was just a dead hunk of wood like the rest of them, had bloomed with flowers and olives, uh, excuse me, uh, almonds. And that's how they knew that, that God had selected Aaron to be the high priest, that they weren't just pulling this uh, power trip, which is what they were being accused of. And so inside the Ark of the Covenant, you had the tables of the uh, Ten Commandments, you had a bowl of manna, and you had Aaron's rod that had buddy. And he says, um, and over it, the cherubs of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Why? Because over history and even now, the Ark of the Covenant is not known its location anymore. But, he says, <clears throat> into the second, and he's describing the segments, the, the, the rooms within the tabernacle. In the first room, you had the place where the priests would go and just get their incense for the sacrifices and, and do their business. But into the second place in the Holy of Holies was just the Ark of the Covenant and the golden candlestick. And it says, into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Okay. So the priests were in and out of the first place of the tabernacle all the time. Throughout the day, they just went in and out of the tabernacle as part of their duties. But into the holiest place, into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was signified by the Ark of the Covenant, that was off limits, except for once a year, 
the high priest would go in there and he would enter in a very specific manner. He would first have to purify himself with a sacrifice for himself and with special washings and with blood that he would offer for himself. And then he would enter in with the blood that he would offer for the people. Okay. Only once a year. The Holy Ghost, verse 8, the Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest place of all was not yet made manifest, uh, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So even while the first tabernacle was standing, even while they were doing these sacrifices, he was proving that you can't by your own works get to God, which was a figure for the times present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So even as they offered those sacrifices, they knew that those sacrifices were not enough to make them perfect before God. They knew that our works were not enough to make us right before God. Those that offered sacrifices weren't made perfect by the service that they did because they could not enter into the presence of God at will. Okay? This was to show that no matter how good a person's works were, even in the holy work that they were doing of God, they couldn't please God by their own efforts. Chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, chapter 9, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of the Reformation. Okay, so speaking of those rituals and the laws that they had um, of what would make a person clean, uh, what would make a person unclean until a certain number of days had passed? Uh, what would make a person unclean if you had to go and bury a family member? Uh, then, then in order to be made clean again, you'd have to offer a certain sacrifice, go through a certain cleansing ritual until a certain number of days were fulfilled, and then you would be clean again. There uh, were certain dietary restrictions against things that they could not eat. Uh, they could not wear clothing of mixed fabrics. Okay, you couldn't wear clothing that was linen and wool at the same time. You weren't allowed to. They couldn't grow different types of crops in the same field. There were very strict restrictions against them. It says it's these works that they had to do, the, the particular order that they had to follow God's restrictions in, it stood in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of the Reformation. The emphasis being on until. Because these ordinances, the, the clean and unclean, the, the dietary restrictions, these were all designated as temporary within the scope of the law. God never intended them to be permanent. It was always to show, look, you people want to try just living for me and saying, if I give you a list of do's and don'ts, you can do enough. Well, I'll show you that you can't. And so he gave mankind a list of do's and don'ts and said, have at it. And how many generations they failed at it every time. Okay. Now, as you read through the Old Testament, and I actually looked this up today because I wanted to be careful in how I presented it, you'll see things that are spoken of as abominations. Abominations means hateful and detested things. Some of these things, God says, these are abominations unto you. It means you've got to have your heart against them if you're going to have your heart on me. Okay? But there are some things that God says are abominations unto him. This is an abomination unto the Lord your God. Those things, the things that the Bible says, the things that God says are an abomination unto himself, those are not simply ceremonial. Those have not been done away with. God has not changed his heart on those because they were still, again, as we said, they were before the law, they were written into the law, and they're still carried over in the things that are taught in the New Testament. Things like cross-dressing, things like infanticide, sexual promiscuity, idolatry, okay? These are things that defy the very nature of that God created for his people to abide in, okay? And God says that they are an abomination unto him. Chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is to say, not of a building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own 
shedding blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? For this cause he, be, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an inher eternal e inheritance. Okay, So the animal sacrifices were, even while they were being offered, only a temporary cleansing an atonement for sinners. Their deaths being the means of the implementation of that first testament, as it says in uh, verse 15, it was effectuated, God's uh, willingness to accept his people and redeem his people was effectuated by their offering of these sacrifices, but they had to be repeated time after time after time. Okay? I'd have to offer a sacrifice for myself every time I did something wrong. And as a minister, I'd have to offer sacrifice on behalf of anybody who came to me for certain types of needs. Okay? And it wouldn't just be, okay, God, I offered that kind of sacrifice for so-and-so. Now I don't have to offer it again for such-and-such. He said, nope, every person needs their own. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to get a lot of blood all over my clothes. And that's why God said, well, you got to keep washing your clothes. God put in there rules about how the priest had to keep washing themselves because they get blood all over themselves. I mean, you can read it. Yeah. He was very practical. He said, build, build a big old tub out there and you're going to have to wash yourselves in it before you come into the tabernacle. He really did say that in, in more precise terms than I just said. He really did say that. But the supremacy of Jesus' sacrifice over the sacrifice of these animals is so exceeding that it is complete in one offering, one time, once and for all. And we'll even get to where it says once and for all, okay? So that it does not need to be repeated ever again. Because how much greater is God himself than any goat Right. or any uh, lamb, or any bull. How much greater is God himself when he came to be one of us, when it says in he, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, that he emptied himself of his glory, that he could come down as a man and take upon himself flesh, that he might become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How much greater is God that he would do that? It says that he, through the eternal spirit, offered himself. His sacrifice is effective eternally. It doesn't need to be repeated. Jesus initiated and effectuated the New Testament by his sacrifice, giving redemption, cleansing, atonement, salvation for sinners. Okay? No more having to bring a sheep with you every time you come to church. You know? I've read that uh, on the on the Day of Atonement, which was a day when all of Israel had to come and present themselves, uh, all the men of Israel had to come and present themselves at Jerusalem. That as as Israel became a, a bigger city, you know, and Israel grew, um, they actually had to dig trenches away from the the area of the temple because there was so much blood that would flow from the area of the temple and the altar, that it would run like rivers through those trenches that they built. From the, all the sacrifices that the people would bring to offer to God. But every time, that was just one big holiday, but every time you'd come to worship God, you'd have to bring a sacrifice. It didn't always have to be a goat or a ram or a bull. Sometimes it would be smaller things, but every time he said, you can't come before God empty handed. You got to bring meal, you know, which was flour, ground flour. You'd have to bring oil. You'd have to bring uh, doves. You'd have to bring something. You'd have to bring something. But now Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator. For a testimony is of, uh, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all when the testator lived. Jesus couldn't have come and lived and walked on the earth and said, I'm giving you redemption just by my being here. He had to die. Otherwise, the animal sacrifices would have continued. He would have still been God. He could have still walked around doing miracles and healings. 
walking on the water and showing others that they can walk with him in victory. But in order to give us redemption, salvation, by faith in him and without sacrifices, he had to give us something better than the animals. And so he gave himself. Okay, He had to give us something better than the animals. And so he gave himself. For a testimony is of force after men are dead. He had to die in order to close the Old Testament and open the New Testament. Okay? Okay? That's important because I'm going to make a point here. There is no other gospel because there's no other way of salvation than by faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Okay? Paul also said in Galatians chapter 1, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now I say it again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That means if anybody comes along and tells you that there's another way of salvation than Jesus Christ and by faith in him alone. The Bible says they're accursed. Okay? There's no other gospel. Plain and simple. There can also be no other testament. Okay? For where a testament is, this is Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. We've led up to it with, with the bulls and the goats and the sacrifices of the animals being the, the means of implementing the, new te the Old Testament. But Jesus, it says in verse 15, is the mediator of the New Testament. That means he's the one that declares it to be valid and puts it into effect. Verse 16 says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is no strength at all, while the testator liveth. There can be no other testament. The only way that there could be another testament would be if somebody greater than Jesus Christ died to provide a greater benefit to the people of God. What? greater benefit is there to the people of God than being All right. saved All right. Amen. and having the promises of God. And who is there greater than God himself yes. to yes. die in our place Amen. and give us that? Okay? And the only way that Jesus could have, as some say, another testament of Jesus Christ, the only way that Jesus himself could have another another testament would be if he were to die again. He can't have two. He can't have two. A person has a last will and testament. Not two wills and testaments. They would contra contradict and conflict with each other. And the lawyers would have a hard time sorting it out. And they wouldn't be able to mesh them. They'd have to throw one out altogether. Okay. The only way that Jesus could have another testament would be if he were to die again. And he's not going to. Right. Romans chapter 6 verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, right. death hath no more dominion over him. Amen. He did it once to prove that he has victory over well, it. Lord, he, he, need did to do say he has the will. He has the power to... He has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He said that in John chapter 10 before he did it just to prove that he could raise up again. Yeah. He's not going to do it again. He said uh, his resurrection and eternal life were already established in Hebrews here when we were talking about his uh, fulfilling the, the Melchizedek priesthood. And Hebrews chapter 7, even before we got to all of this stuff about the sacrifice, it already established his resurrection where it said, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So his death being once and for all means that he's not going to do it again. He's not going to do it again. Jesus Christ is the mediator, the one who made it effective and declared it to be valid of the New Testament. And salvation is by faith in what he's done for us alone. And we live eternally because we have everlasting life through the power of his resurrection. If he were going to die again, that would mean that, would mean that we can't be sure of our own everlasting life. If he were to die again, that would mean we don't know if we really have salvation. So we have the New Testament. We call ourselves New Testament Christian Church. That's because we're living in New Testament times. Okay, We're living in the times of faith in Jesus Christ Amen. being our means of salvation. 
coming through to close up the chapter. I'm going to read this really fast, so if I stumble over a couple of words, please forgive me. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled blood uh, with both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that all the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, and now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place with uh, every year with blood of others for then he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world he has, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifices of himself and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so christ was offered uh, so christ once offered to bear the sins of many and up unto them that look unto him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so again it says that he died once he said once is good enough and if you believe on me it'll be once and up for you well, and he said that's good enough believe in me and you don't need anything else believe in me and you'll have what i have which is life everlasting why put your hope in anything else? He said any other hope is invalid because I've made this valid and effective yes. for you. Yes. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for all that we have in you, for the promises that you have given us, for making them effective at so great a cost to yourself. Help us, Lord, if we may doubt, to look to you, to be encouraged by what you've done for us and to find strength in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening. God bless you. God bless you.